Very good. Uh, yes, Mark chapter 11 this morning. We are continuing on. We are we're over halfway through, so you can rejoice in that, I suppose. But uh, here we are. We're going to try to uh, tackle the uh, entire chapter here of chapter 11 together this morning. I've broken up this passage uh, into five sections. The letter for the day is E, and each little section will start with the letter E as we go through it, if that helps you in your mind. There's nothing obviously magical about the the outlines that we come up with, but sometimes if they can help you uh, gain some insight and re retain uh, what the Word of God is saying to us, by all means, uh, however that works. So uh, I would like to read through this chapter. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, and if you could just follow along uh, in your own Bible as we go forward. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And as they approached Jerusalem, of course that is... Uh, the Lord Jesus and his disciples, at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, in which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had spoken to them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, which means, O oh, save. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he, uh, bl blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna, or O oh, save, in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. And verse 12 would continue. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. When they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to, uh, he began, driving, began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, it, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they would go out of the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree which uh, withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what uh, he says is go going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. And finally, verse 27 through the end of the chapter. They came again to Jerusalem, <clears throat> and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, and you answer me, and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven, 
or from men? Answer me. They began raising it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Then why did you not believe him? But shall we say from men? They were afraid of the people, for everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Let's ask the Lord to help us this morning. Our Father, we have come before you once again, and we have read a passage, a chapter out of your holy word. And it covers things that are very important, very important for us even today, right now. And we would ask that your spirit might really empower uh, uh, your word and, and set your word on fire, as it were, so that it might apply to each one of us and each one of our needs this morning. Father, uh, our soul is, is open and laid bare before you. It says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we just ask that the Spirit of God might be able to apply that sharp two-edged sword exactly where it needs to be put this morning. Father, we pray that the, the speaker this morning would not be heard, but that rather your word would be heard and heeded. We ask all this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So again, I, uh, we've come to this fairly, fairly familiar passage, and you don't have to raise your hand, but if you look in your Bible, likely if you've got these headings that are not inspired, they're just written there by the, the editors to give us a little bit of guideposts as we go through God's Word, you probably have in chapter 11 the triumphal entry or something like that where the Lord Jesus is coming into Jerusalem after many, uh, several years of going around the, the nation of Israel, um, doing good, healing, teaching the people, and we come here to what is commonly known as Palm Sunday. We come here to this day in which the Lord Jesus, and again, my heading says the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem. Well, I'll make more mention of that in just a minute. That is not accurate. This is not the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem. We'll share what will be the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem in just a moment. But this is what has been commonly known as here on Palm Sunday. And you see here, as we've uh, mentioned, and, and this first part is obviously the entry of the Messiah. That's our first outline point, the entry of the Messiah. And uh, the Lord Jesus is coming. Remember that there was some apprehension about coming back to Jerusalem. If you look back just in chapter 10 of Mark, in verse 32, it says that they were following him. They were, those who followed were fearful. And, and you can also tie that into another passage in another place where it says that they were already, the, the, the scribes and the chief priests were already trying to kill Jesus. Even more so after the end of this chapter, but even when they're going into Jerusalem the first time, they're, they're trying to do away with this Jesus. And so there was some apprehension, but they come, they're rounding the corner, as it were, almost there to Jerusalem here at the Mount of Olives, which of course is that hillside right there uh, that has some uh, significance in and of itself, but they're coming, and he sends two of his disciples, and he sends them on ahead, and he said, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to go in to the village opposite you, verse 2, and you're going to find uh, a young donkey, a colt, and he says, this one's going to be unbroken, no one's ever sat on it, and you're going to take it, and you're going to bring it back uh, to me here. Now, <clears throat> obviously, he gives them instruction on what to say when someone says, hey, what are you doing? If someone walks up to, to my house and gets in my car and starts to crank it up and drive off, I'm going to say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, hopefully I'll say that. We may do something else. But anyway, we'll say, hey, what are you doing? And so he had given them instruction to tell them what to do. And interestingly enough, it was that the Lord had need of it. And that was all they needed to know. And we see here from the, the passage here, they find the donkey, they untie it, someone says, hey, what are you doing? He says, the Lord has need of it. He says, by all means, go for it. Now, what's the significance of this? If you would turn back, uh, you're going to run past uh, Matthew, Malachi, into the Old Testament, back a few books to Zechariah, the next to the last book in the Old Testament, 
back just a little ways, not that much. And we will find in Zechariah chapter 9 a prophecy that is relevant to what we're reading right here. Again, you've got uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and then you turn into Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But here over in Zechariah chapter 9, there's a specific prophecy that the Lord Jesus was touching on. And uh, reading in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, it says... Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on, the, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then continuing on, by the way, verse 10, I will cut off, uh, cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war from, uh, will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so for a careful student of the Old Testament, looking for the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, they would, might refer to this passage back here and see that one day... The king would come, humble, sitting on a young donkey, riding in Jerusalem. And they would say, oh, look here. And also in verse 10, it says, and he will rule the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. And that's what many of those Jews wanted the Lord Jesus to do. Right then, when he was coming into Jerusalem, they wanted to get the kingdom on, right? They wanted them to overthrow Rome. They wanted to be able to have their own independent nation again. They wanted not to be under the, the, the rule of those uh, centurions and all those that, that were uh, causing them difficulty. But what they couldn't tell was that here in Zechariah, verses 9 through 10, there's a several thousand year gap between verse 9 and verse 10. Literally, from the end of verse 9 where it says, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey, period, there's a gap. There's a parenthesis. And someone, someone has compared it to someone looking out um, uh, over a long distance and seeing two mountain peaks, perhaps. And you see it, and it almost looks like those two mountain peaks are right beside each other. But as you get closer and closer and you look from the other direction, you see that there's actually a great distance between those two mountain peaks. And that's exactly what this is illustrating. There would be a day in which the Lord Jesus would come just, endowed with salvation, humble, riding on a donkey. But then there would be another day, and they did not, Zechariah didn't know it at the time when he wrote this prophecy. There would be another day in which he would come in a different manner, and we'll look at that in just a minute. But going back to Mark chapter 11, this is where this has come from. This is a fulfillment of that prophecy. In the parallel passage over in Matthew, it actually quotes that passage directly from the Old Testament. And so you see that they come in verses 7 and 8. They, they are um, of Mark chapter 11. They put their coats on, on the donkey. They spread the, the palm branches, the leafy branches they cut. And they're shouting this, uh, again, this prophecy out of the Old Testament. Hosanna, oh save. Again, they're looking for the deliverer. Of Israel, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And so they're looking for the Messiah to do something grand. But what they didn't understand was he is about to do something grand, but it's not what they expected. See, he's about to procure that great salvation. He is about to go to Calvary. He is about to be made sin. He's about to die. He's about to be buried. He's about to rise again. And that is where the victory will be won. Now, I mentioned in our opening that this is not the triumphal entry. You know, there is a, a saying that he came into town riding on his high horse. Well, that's not exactly the case, is it? He came into, ride, uh, came into town riding on a humble young colt, right? Well, again, if you wouldn't mind uh, flipping with me to Revelation chapter 19. This 
boys and girls, is the triumphal entry. This is where the Lord Jesus did come into town on his high horse. This is a little different scene. So Revelation chapter 19 goes without saying a lot has transpired already in the book of Revelation. And finally, you see in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, the triumphal entry. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and, his head are, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is when the Lord Jesus will come back. And we're told that he will come back, and get this, he will come back and his foot will touch down on the Mount of Olives, the very place where he began his journey on a young colt into the city of Jerusalem. He will come back again, not on a young colt, but on a white, pure, righteous, holy horse. And I don't know if that's a literal horse or something else, but whatever it is, he comes back. And he will rule the world, rule the nations with a rod of iron. And everyone will finally give him the glory that he so rightfully deserves. But first, the cross. And so that's what you see, as it were, the beginning of that journey to the cross starts right here. Really started in centuries and uh, eternity past. But here we have it uh, recorded for us. You see the road to Calvary uh, coming into view from right here. And so verse 11, back in Mark chapter 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem. And notice what he does. This is very important. After looking around at everything. That's an interesting phrase. The Lord Jesus comes into the city of God, and he looks around, and he leaves. I wonder what he saw. Well, we don't have to wonder, actually. He's going to come back the next day, and we'll see it. But it's very instructive to me that the Lord Jesus came just to look around first, to see what's there. You know, he sees what's in our hearts as well. He sees what's in our life as well. And I would, I would challenge us all to question, is he pleased with what he sees? We'll see what he thinks of what's going on there in Jerusalem here in just a minute. But, you know, as I mentioned in our opening prayer, the Bible says that the, the sword, that the word of God is like a sharp two-edged sword. It can fillet open our soul. In fact, it says that it is so sharp that it can make that distinction between soul and spirit, something that, quite frankly, I still can't define. If you tell me what's the difference between the soul and the spirit, and you can ask a lot of people, and some people have good definitions for it. I don't know. I know there's a difference, but the Bible says that the Word of God can divide between the soul and spirit. It can be that specific when it's talking about our heart and our soul and our mind and our spirit. And so he comes and he looks around. That scene that we just saw in Revelation, it says his eyes are a flame of fire. You know, fire reveals things. Fire uh, purifies things. And his very look is something that can reveal the true intentions of a matter. But I think it's also instructive that here you have the Messiah coming to the city of God, to, what was it, the temple of God? And he doesn't even stay there. He has to leave. He leaves and goes somewhere else to be in a small town, a quiet town. It reminds me of the book of Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears me and opens it, I will come in. And that's oftentimes used as an invitation to the sinner. You know, the Lord Jesus is knocking on the heart of the sinner I mean, you can use that if you want to. That's fine. But that's not what it's talking about. 
the Lord Jesus is standing on the outside of the church of the Laodiceans, knocking, trying to get into the church. The church was so corrupt that they had locked the Lord Jesus outside, and he's trying to get inside. And it's kind of the same scene here. The temple was so corrupt, so full of merchandise, so commercialized, that the Lord Jesus had no place to rest his head, as it were. And so he entered Jerusalem, looks around, and then he leaves again. And so that's our first little section, the Lord Jesus enters, the entry of the Messiah. And then the second part is the example of the fig tree. Now notice, he rides into town, he looks, he leaves. Well, on the next day, when he had left Bethany, he became hungry. Verse 13 says he sees a fig tree in leaf, good-looking fig tree, perhaps. And you can see him examining the, the boughs of the, the boughs of the, uh, of the tree, trying to find a fig to satisfy his, uh, his hunger, because obviously he was uh, fully man, but also fully God. And he couldn't find a fig to satisfy his hunger. You know, the Lord Jesus is looking for fruit. We, we actually heard that out of the book of Genesis recently, several times actually, that God made his creation, whatever it may be in the, the uh, animal world, in the uh, plant world, in uh, mankind world, <laughs> he wants mankind to be fruitful. He wants his world to be fruitful. And so when the Lord Jesus is looking for something, he's looking for fruit. He's looking for the evidence of growth, not just the, the foliage that comes with it. He wants evidence of growth. He wants to see some produce from what he's doing. And so he looks, and he can't find anything on this fig tree. And so he says this, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And, of course, the disciples there might have thought, hmm, he really wanted to find some fruit from that tree. And I, I don't know if they thought about it anymore or not. Like, oh, well, we need to find the master a fig tree because he really wants some figs this morning. Or whatever the case may be. He will use this to teach them something else here in just a moment that we'll read about later. But really what this is is an example of the nation of Israel. Because if you, you can see the parallel. He comes to Jerusalem, he looks around, he leaves. He sees the fig tree, he looks around, he leaves. It's an example that he wanted to see fruit from the nation of Israel. And he came looking for it. And he couldn't find any. Over in Luke's passage where the Lord Jesus comes into town, it says that he wept over Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you stoned the prophets. You killed those who were sent to you. He said, how often I wanted to gather you to myself as a hen gathers in her little chicks, and you would not have it. And so he wanted to find some fruit from the people of Israel, and he found nothing, just like the example of this fig tree. In Matthew chapter 24, uh, 25 actually I believe it is, where the Lord Jesus is talking about the, the end of the age and the tribulation and, and various end time events, it says when you see the fig tree in leaf, know that its time of harvest is near. And so seeing this fig tree in leaf should have been the indication that there would have been fruit and yet he could not find it. And so he pronounced this curse against this particular tree. He says, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. Our third little section here this morning, verse 15, continued on. So the disciples witness that scene there. And then finally, or not finally, verse uh, 15, you have uh, the extermination of the temple. Now, this is not the only time that the Lord Jesus has done this. <clears throat> you will remember, uh, matter of fact, if you wouldn't mind, turn over there because it is relevant. There's a, there's a particular phrase I'd have us note. John chapter 2, the gospel of John chapter 2, over just a couple of books. The Lord Jesus' ministry is just beginning over here 
in uh, John chapter 2. This is about three years earlier uh, in, the, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And he also comes to the temple once again. John chapter 2 and verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near, same time of year, almost three years ago to the, to the day. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And they continue on uh, in that same passage, arguing about how long it took to build this wonderful temple and so forth. But we know that he's referring to him dying on the cross and being raised up three days later. But notice, they had the same stuff three years ago. The Lord Jesus went in, drove out the animals, drove out those who were making a profit, those who were... uh, changing out the money of those who might come from different places and no doubt uh, having a nice little interest fee added on to it. And he drove them out, overturned it, sent them all out. Stop making my father's house a place of business. And three years later, nothing had changed. They were doing the exact same thing that the Lord Jesus had told them not to do. Back in Mark chapter 11, if you would, he came to Jerusalem, entered the temple, and began, and he began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who were selling doves. You can't tell whether I'm reading from John or Mark, can you? And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise to the temple. He uses a different verse of scripture in this case. He says, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? but you have made it a robber's den. God wanted this place to be a place where not just the Israelites, but the nations could come and talk to God. That's what he wanted it. But what what it had descended into, a place where men could make a few bucks, and notice, interesting, uh, of course, the, the, the animals and all that. You can just see it's just a ruckus. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's not a place. If you want to have a quiet time with God, going to a petting zoo in the middle of the summer is not the place to do it, right? All right? So that's what it looked like. And so, and, and notice also, um, in particular, verse, 16, uh, verse 15, the end of verse 15. It particularly says those who were selling doves. I think that's also instructive because you remember doves were the the cheapest, lowest possible sacrifice that someone could bring. In fact, the Lord Jesus said you could get two doves for a cent. That's a bargain. (laughs) I doubt you could get two doves for a cent there. I don't know that. I'm just guessing. But my thought is that they are exploiting those who had nothing else, and they're taking the, the cheapest, lowest form of sacrifice and making whatever they can make off of it. When God specifically intended that those who could only bring a couple of doves, they brought what they could. And they brought what they could do so that they could still fulfill God's law. You remember uh, Mary and Joseph, when they brought the Lord Jesus to the temple eight days after he was born and presented him as they were according to the law. They brought two turtle doves, because they couldn't afford, uh, forgive me, I don't remember what the, the, the ordinary sacrifice was, a goat or a sheep or whatever. It says if you can't afford that, just bring a couple doves. Perhaps even the thought was maybe you could even catch your own doves. I don't know. Maybe you could go out and find your own doves and just use those to be obedient to the Lord. And yet these that were running the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, They had seen where they could really, really stick it to not only the Jews, but all those that would come around and they could really 
uh, fatten their purses by uh, this, this method of, of merchandise. And so they completely missed the point. God was nowhere to be seen. You couldn't see him for all the animal traffic. You couldn't see him for all the greed that was poured out all over all of the tables. And so he goes in there with great zeal and with great gusto, and he disrupts their place of business, business because it wasn't their place of business to begin with. It was his father's place, a place where you could go to have a relationship with God. In verse 19, again, when evening came, they would go out of the city. You see, the problem with making a commercialized, merchandise-driven place of worship, quote-unquote, was that God is usually not there. And so when we come to worship God, we need to make sure that our hearts are right before the Lord and that our uh, lives are focused on the one who has called us to be there in the first place. And so you have, again, the Lord Jesus laying out the, the real need for them to come to him, not on their own terms, but on his terms. So in verse 20, they're headed back out from Jerusalem. And you have our fourth little section here, the expectation of faith. They pass by where the Lord Jesus had previously stopped to try to get some breakfast. And they see the fig tree withered from the roots up. Now, it wasn't like the pesticide truck came by and sprayed it. It was withered from the roots up. It died from the source of life up. I don't know how they could tell that, but at any rate, from the roots up. And Peter remembered that. And he said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And the Lord Jesus used this, again, I believe that the fig tree illustration was a, a picture of Israel, but he also uses it for them in a personal way. He says, have faith in God. Believe what God has done and can do. And he says, verse 23 and 24 has been uh, quoted many times. Uh, you know, there's a songs written about it, and God's a mountain mover and so forth, and that's absolutely true. <clears throat> he says, Whoever says this mountain be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says is going to happen will be granted him. Now, what is this saying? Now, can we just go to God and ask him for whatever we want? No, it is not the case. We understand that too. We understand that God has a place for us in his will. And he allows us to participate in those things. We don't need to limit God, <clears throat> that's for sure. I've been thinking a lot of the scene there in Joshua, and I've mentioned it before, but it, it really has become one of my favorite passages in recent days. Joshua is uh, on the march throughout the city of, uh, of the land of Canaan, going through the various cities, conquering as he goes, and <clears throat> he reaches this place there in the heat of the battle, and he calls upon God. And he says, O oh, sun, stand still in Agilon, and O oh, moon in the valley of uh, Gibeah, I believe it is. And he says that there was never a day like it. The sun stood still. The moon stopped moving until Israel was able to avenge itself of its enemies. Now, that's an amazing thing. When Joshua needed help from God, he didn't ask for more men. He didn't ask for an Abrams tank. He didn't ask for a cruise missile. He just says, you know what? My God runs the solar system. My God turns the lights on and off. And I need a little bit more light today. I'm just going to ask my God to keep the lights on a little bit longer. Motel 6 stole that, by the way. So anyway, the, the thought is, he was not afraid to ask God for big stuff. He was not afraid to put his God to the test in the sense that I believe God can do what he wants to. And I believe that we are engaged in this conflict according to God's will. And I'm not afraid to ask God for help during this time. And we need to understand that. You know, sometimes we ask for things and God doesn't grant them. And I'm not going to pretend to explain to you why that is. But I know this. 
that we can ask God for big stuff and it doesn't embarrass him. We can ask God for impossible things and he's not afraid of those things. And so when it says, take this mountain and cast it into the sea, we're not going around with a magic wand, you know, just flexing our stuff with a little bit of pixie dust. We understand that we can rely upon God to do the impossible. And that, that's what I take away from this, that there may be situations. It may be a health crisis. It may be in our own life or someone else's life. It may be a, a financial situation. It may be a government situation. It may be that you're in, uh, in danger of your life. It may be something that is absolutely beyond the control of mankind and luck and all the other stuff. And you can go to God and you can ask for it. And he's not afraid to speak to you regarding that. Now, sometimes, like we always go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, our God's able to deliver us. But even if we burn up in this fire, he's still going to deliver us. Sometimes we don't know the outcome. And we need to understand that God is still in control. But what he's saying is, believe God. Believe that God can do anything. And don't limit him. Don't give him just a list of options and say, Lord, I'd really like you to pick one of these. Don't limit God's power. Don't limit what he can do in our life. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> it is a powerful thing to see someone who believes God recklessly, who believes him with no reservation, with no questioning that whatever happens, I'm going to trust God. And that's the kind of faith that he wants us to have. And so I would also gain from this passage, the Lord Jesus passed by this fig tree, said no one's going to eat fruit from you again that afternoon. Nobody was going to ever eat fruit from that tree again because the roots were dead. We've got a crepe myrtle that will be there forever. And I, every week, I pull up more crepe myrtles from the roots because the roots aren't dead. But this one, the roots are dead. In verse 25, I would, I would also gain insight from this to know that, that we have God's ear in these things. It says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. We have his ear, but he also wants us to come with a pure heart. You know, forgiveness, that's a, that's a big, big topic, isn't it? Sometimes we get hurt very badly, don't we? Sometimes we have these uh, issues in our life that really do cause us pain, and we really have this, uh, what we feel like, an inability to forgive someone else. I remember, just as a young fellow, um, some of you may remember he's a, he was a, he's a terrorist, but he's a, a Eric Robert Rudolph. And he was the one who bombed the 1996 Olympics, and he bombed a, a, a clinic up in Birmingham, an abortion clinic, actually. Um, and he was on the run for many, many years, and they finally caught him, and he's in jail for the rest of his life. But one of the nurses that was hurt uh, in that clinic bombing in Birmingham, uh, I remember uh, her saying on, on TV, said, I will never forgive him. I will never forgive him for what he has done to me. And she, uh, uh, she's got scra uh, shrapnel all in her uh, body from, from the explosion, and, and she's really had a, a difficult time. Her name's Emily Lyons. But anyway, she said there, and I remember thinking about that, well, that's not good. Just as a young fellow, I remember that's not good at all because the Bible says if you don't forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive either. And she makes no claims to be a Christian, but I remember seeing that. And I thought, wow, that's dangerous ground. And when we think about what God has forgiven or could forgive us of, it's really nothing. In fact, the Lord Jesus told a parable about it. There was a, a man who owned someone money, and it was a few bucks, comparatively. And he went out and he began choking this man. He's like, you must repay, you must repay, or I'm going to throw you in, in jail. And then there was he who owed his master 
a great sum. It was like the U.S. current deficit amount of debt. There was never any way that it was ever going to be paid off, and the master forgave him. And you see, God has forgiven us an insurmountable debt. For those of us who have been forgiven and given new life, the debt that we have been forgiven is staggering. And so when we have to forgive our brother or sister a few bucks, we need to remember Calvary. We, re- we need to remember what the Lord Jesus has forgiven us of. But don't forget, we've got heaven's ear. We've got a place to go to God with whatever we have. And then finally, verses 27 through the end of the chapter is the evidence of his authority. So they came back again, third day, to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, remember... <clears throat> in that passage that we just read in John, they asked the same thing three years ago. Said, what authority do you have for this? Well, he's about to show them here in a few days when he dies on the cross and rises again. But they were saying, you know, you can't come into, and I'm uh, filling in the blank here, the, the part that didn't say, our place of business, and do all this, disrupt our flow of business. Who said you could do this? Who gave you this authority? And rather than answering the question and casting his pearls before swine, he says, I'll ask you a question. How about this? Because the Lord Jesus likes to ask us questions. He likes to use questions to get us to think. And he says, that baptism of John, was it from heaven or man? Men. And you can see this group of um, well-dressed, sophisticated, intelligent, intellectual men kind of conferring to themselves, talking amongst themselves, you know, they might, he might have got us with that question. Because if we say heaven, then we probably should have believed John's baptism. <laughs> but if we say men, well, all these people surrounding us are going to throw stones at us because they thought it was from heaven. And so they take the political... Uh, politically correct answer and say, "Ah, we don't know. And the Lord Jesus says, well, I'm not going to tell you either. And it wasn't that he was being cute. It wasn't that he was just plain hard to get. A couple of things. One, they should have known already. In this very um, uh, book, the past 11 chapters that we've looked at, the Lord Jesus, and I I don't have the number in front of me. I forgot uh, my notes, but probably seven, eight, maybe ten times he talks about authority. I have authority, authority. There was one particular situation where there was a man with a withered hand, you might recall. And he was there and he says, your your sins are forgiven, son. You know, he had the withered hand, whatever that meant. And he said, the, the, uh, the scribe says, who gave you authority to forgive sins? And he says, well, I'll show you the authority by healing his hand too, by the way. And so he heals his hand. And so they should have seen all through even just the accounts that we have in this book that his authority came from heaven. The people recognized it. The people said, There's, this is different. He teaches as with authority. He has the authority of God with him. And furthermore, like I mentioned uh, a minute ago, there are none... None so blind who will not see, as those who will not see. They refused to accept the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. You remember, they called him Beelzebub. And that's when he says, that's the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is not you doing something so bad, but the unpardonable sin is you closing your heart to the gospel. That's what will condemn you to hell. And so he comes to this scene, he's about to be go, go to Calvary, he's about to be made sin for the whole world, and they're still questioning, trying to trap him, trying to get something so that they can do away with this pest as they would think of it. And they refuse to accept the truth that he is God's son, the Messiah. And it, again, verse 33, I will not tell you by what authority I do these things. He already had. And now he's not going to, as I mentioned before, cast his pearls before swine. 
The Proverbs say, He who hardens his neck after much reproof, it will be broken suddenly and beyond remedy. And so they had already made up their mind that they were not going to accept this one as the Messiah. And the Lord Jesus is not going to give them any more light. It's a sad thing to think about, too. In this world, the Lord gives us all light. And by light, I mean He gives us revelation. He gives us insight into who He is. He allows us to see things from His Word, allows us to read His Word, see things in creation. He gives all that light to us, each one with a different amount, granted, each one with different circumstances, different environment, but He gives it all to us so that we would respond to Him, so that we would uh, acknowledge Him, that we would understand Him more. And if we refuse to acknowledge Him, if we refuse to, to understand him more, he'll take that light away. He'll take that insight away so that we'll become even more hardened in our rebellion against him. And so that's why it's very important for all of us to respond to the light that we have been given, respond to the revelation that we have been given. Even this morning, as we read his word, one of the things that I always like to pray is that God would apply his word in each one of our hearts, specifically according to our need, so that we might respond just as we need to in our life, in our circumstance. And so that's Mark chapter 11. As we continue on, there will be some more teaching and some more uh, interaction. But ultimately what we're getting to is that place where he will go, he will go to Calvary. We know the Garden of Gethsemane, the so-called trials, in the courts, but then ultimately he is going to go to the cross. And that is where he would be made sin for us so that we all might enjoy the salvation of God together. Our Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to look into the workings and the interactions of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we need this type of instruction in our lives, Father, so that we might <coughs> so that we might be better equipped in this world. Lord, we don't understand all of your will, but we do know this, that it is the desire of all men, the desire for you is your desire for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And sometimes we face circumstances in our life, Father, that seem impossible. And we pray that we would trust you, that we would understand that you can do the impossible, that you can move a mountain and cast it into the sea. That's no big deal for you. You don't have degrees of difficulty in your will. And so we pray that we might trust you and that we might be able to gain insight just from living for you. We thank you so much for your word. We, we see the Lord Jesus humble, riding on a donkey, endowed with salvation, offering it to whosoever will. But Father, there will be another day and he will come back on a white horse. He will have Lord of Lords and King of Kings written upon him. And Father, salvation's offer will be expired by then. Father, not that the salvation that we enjoy will ever lose its power, but the opportunity to accept him as Savior and bow the knee now will have passed. Father, we pray that that would not be the case for anyone who's under the sound of our, my voice this morning, that all might come to him right now, acknowledge him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, before that great and awful day. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be saved. We thank you for the Lord Jesus' cross work and his resurrection seals the deal. We just pray that you might bless each one of us as we go forward now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.